Okay, so my name is Thomas Shaw. I've been a build engineer for five years at Demonware. Uh, Demonware is a, a small studio that's owned by Activision. And um, Activision bought us in 2007. And the plan was that all the network middleware um, that Activision required for studios would all go through Demonware. So whenever a studio would be um, publishing a game, they would be using our services for like uh, matchmaking, for storage, for single identity. So Demonware was the one central point for those types of services. Uh, today's talk is about SkyPilot. So SkyPilot was a project that was approved by Activision. And the plan was that we wanted to modernize how we deploy services to production. Uh, for the first 10 years of Demonware, uh, deployments of game services, um, they were done manually. Um, the clusters were set up by the ops folks. Our developers would throw a couple of packages over the wall. They'd be set up um, using a, a bit of automation, um, but it wasn't anywhere near as modern as it should be. Um, we had lots of breakages. Um, it was quite costly. We had multiple teams just to roll out one title, for example. And this talk is about how do we modernize that? Uh, how do we roll out services even faster? How do we have a fully automated continuous delivery pipeline? Um, how do we reduce the human costs? Ideally, we'd like uh, a single developer to be able to roll out a large title. Okay, so this is the agenda. I'll just cover very briefly who Demonware are, uh, what Skypilot is, some of the principles behind the project, uh, the workflows, and then uh, a few takeaways at the end. Okay, so as well as providing the, the services for games, such as the multiplayer, uh, storage, and single identity, for example, um, we also run those services on our own infrastructure. So we own our own DCs. Um, um, this, this has worked pretty well for us in the past. But the problem is the human cost of rolling out a new title is really high. Um, our utilization of our hardware is really poor. Um, every year we'd build up a cluster for a, a AAA title like Call of Duty. And every year, every cluster was different. So we have like 10 years worth of like snowflake clusters that we're maintaining. Um, and that's what Demonware do. We provide those services and every year we work with studios to provide new services based on the requirements of whatever game is coming out. Uh, so for example, Destiny a couple of years ago had a, a bunch of new requirements for game services that Demonware uh, created and we worked with the studios quite closely in that. Uh, these are some of the games. Um, for anybody who's in the Call of Duty, um, we've, been, we've been hosting the, the online services since 2007. Um, we've also um, dabbled in some other games. For example, we worked with Blizzard a couple of years ago for Diablo. Um, and then this, this project was focused around Skylanders Imaginators. Uh, there's a reason why we chose Skylanders. Um, we kind of decided that if we're going to modernize our continuous delivery pipeline, we couldn't choose a big title like Call of Duty. It was just far too risky. So we actually uh, went to Activision and made a proposal that we pick one of the smaller titles and we completely change how we deploy uh, that title to production. So we moved away from bare metal servers. Um, we we're running um, the, the services and containers in AWS. Okay, so this is a very brief history. These circles aren't to, um, they're not the scale, but just gives you an idea of the sort of growth that we've seen in Demoware. Uh, 2009, we had 20 people in the company. And then we grew to about 170 in uh, 2015. So as the company grew, we started to notice all these cracks. Whenever you have a 20 people in a company, everybody kind of knows how to do everything because it's just part of uh, the, the setup. As the company expands, we had lots of gaps in knowledge. Um, one person may leave the company and all of a sudden you don't know how to um, deploy a, a specific service or you don't, how a, you don't know how a certain tool works. So lots of these gaps kind of appeared as the company grew. Uh, the number of concurrent users we had to support um, back in 2004, uh, Demonware was supporting tens of thousands of users. And then 2015, uh, it was millions of users. So trying to scale our services up at that sort of rate was quite a, quite a challenge. Um, our code base grew naturally, um, but instead of going down the, the microservices route, we tended just to keep all our services in one sort of monolithic code base. And over time, this has become quite an issue for us. So um, we're hoping that this project has kind of given us a, a bit of a, a way to hopefully go down the microservices route in the future, because we'll be able to set up these continuous delivery pipelines and break out our services from this massive monolith that we currently have. Uh, the num number of services at the moment, I think we have over 100 different services that we maintain. Um, we have to maintain titles for 10 years. Um, this proves to be quite challenging as well. Um, 
yeah, <laughs> so basically as the number of services increases, as people leave, we need to make sure those services are well maintained, well documented, and that we can basically cope with that, uh, with supporting 100 services over a 10 year period. Uh, the operational overhead uh, was massive. Um, it used to take a, a team of ops folks to, to build out a production cluster for Call of Duty or for any of the large titles. Uh, it was very specialist um, knowledge as well. Um, it wasn't really documented. It tended to be quite sort of ad hoc. And if something broke, you'd typically have to phone up maybe one or two people at 3 o'clock in the morning and get it fixed. Um, there wasn't that knowledge sharing across the company, which is a real sort of pain point for Demonware as we grew. Okay, so Skypilot, it was a project about modernizing um, how we deliver services in the production. Uh, we use containers, um, we use continuous delivery, uh, we use new tools like Jenkins, Messes Marathon. We tried to, to mix it up a bit. We were basically given um, a bit of freedom by Activision. Uh, they didn't tie us down to a really specific set of uh, requirements. They basically told us to go away and provide a solution within nine months, and they gave us the budget to do this. Um, it's worth pointing out that um, the nine month um, length of the, the project is quite misleading. We've actually been using Docker since 2013, and we've been building up our, our skill set around containers for a number of years before Skypilot came along. So all our developers knew the Docker API really well. They knew tools like Compose, Machine. Um, they were quite well first in containers and how they worked. So by the time Skypilot came along, um, there wasn't that much about containers that we didn't know, and I think that really helped the project. I think if we didn't have that two-year foundation, I don't think uh, the project would have been as successful as it was. Okay, so this was the official mission statement. This is what we showed uh, the execs at um, Activision. Uh, basically, the TLDR is that we wanted to um, keep moving fast, we want to be reliable, and we want to unlock agility in our engineers. Um, our developers are spending far too much time worrying about how the cluster is being set up, worrying about the process that really they shouldn't really have had to care about. So we wanted to unlock that agility and just allow developers to focus on providing uh, game services. And that's, that's, the whole, um, that's the whole point behind Skypilot. It's about un unlocking agility, like shortening the iteration times between an idea and a developer's head and getting to production. Um, yep. So we had lots of problems that we had to try and solve. Uh, specialist knowledge, as I mentioned earlier, as the company grew and people left, uh, a lot of knowledge left with them, and that was never documented. So whenever something fell over in production, um, <laughs> often we would have to actually phone up the, um, the engineer who had already left the company and ask them to come in and help us out because we had no way of fixing it ourselves. So that's a real sort of um, pain point. Uh, it wasn't efficient either. Our hardware utilization was really, really very low. I think it was less than 10%. Uh, we used to over-provision um, really heavily because we just didn't know how successful a game was going to be. Uh, so for Call of Duty, for example, it's quite embarrassing if we only provisioned a certain amount and then on launch day it's incredibly successful and like we just run out of um, compute. So we always like um, over-provision really heavily. Uh, our environments weren't consistent. We used some of our own tools. So we had like semi-automated rollouts. We used a bit of pipe, uh, we used some puppet um, rules for setting up boxes. But over time, um, everybody in ops had access to these clusters, and as fixes would go in, the environments would kind of mutate, and they would become these snowflakes that nobody really knew um, what was inside them, and we're, we're kind of afraid to touch these. Um, and we have quite a few of these running at the moment. Um, also, the big problem is our developers have to work closely with ops. So if a developer wants to roll out a new service, they basically have to sit down with ops folks and explain what needs to be done, what, what config needs to be reloaded, um, what database schemas need to be um, imported, stuff like that. It's quite a painful process. There's a lot of back and forth, and um, it's just really time consuming. OK. I love this quote because um, Morgan Brickley is one of the original members of Demonware. He's been there since the very beginning. And he's a very laid back sort of guy, like very, very chilled. I just came up with this quote, so I just thought I'd stick it in here. Um, but he was, he was completely right. Uh, for a number of years, Demonware had kept uh, iterating on their, their tooling in between launches. So as soon as we got a title out in November, we would start iterating on our tools for next launch, which would be the following year. So we pretty much had a year long iteration cycle. 
once next year comes, um, we look at what went wrong and then we iterate again. So the iteration time was really, really slow. Uh, what we needed was a way to iterate really fastly. So it wasn't an evolution as such, it was um, it's a revolution. Um, we also had some other problems with the project. It wasn't a complete greenfield. Um, we'd never run services in containers um, in a production way before. Uh, we'd use containers in the build and test stages, um, but we didn't really have any, have any confidence that if we were running these long term that they would be, be stable. So that was, um, that was something that stood out quite early. Uh, monolithic code base, I kind of covered that already. Um, we're trying to get away from that at the moment, trying to break it down into smaller services. Uh, our internal tooling was never designed for containers. Um, it's been iterated on for the past 10 years, and it's just focused around bare metal, about deploying like matchmaking and different types of services on bare metal. So we had to create a, a new set of tooling. Uh, our processes across teams was really, there was such a, a difference. Some teams were really well first in containers and continuous integration and delivery, and other teams were a bit slower to move. So we kind of needed to get everybody up to the same sort of point. We needed the processes to mature. We couldn't have a continuous delivery pipeline that had like black boxes or um, processes that weren't well defined. And um, yeah, so this is one of the most challenging parts of the project. We had to get everybody up to the same level. And we actually had to go into teams and say, look, this is what we expect from your, from your service. We can't do stuff like ad hoc anymore. Everything needs to be defined in a pipeline and we need complete traceability. If your service goes down in production, or your monitoring tool, your logging tool breaks in production, we need to be able to trace this all the way back to source. Um, we can't just have these like heroics where somebody will log in at three o'clock in the morning and, and fix the service or fix a, a piece of tooling. Um, we need much more transparency and um, we need our processes to be more mature. Okay, so I'm just gonna tackle these in a different order. Um, codifying our deployments. This is kind of industry standard at this point. Um, codifying your delivery pipeline, your infrastructure, uh, your build and test environments. Um, this is all kind of standard practice, but it's stuff that we hadn't done in the past. We had so many like manual processes and um, it was very hard to actually reproduce any of our environments because the automation wasn't there. Um, we needed to become more lean as well. We were incredibly wasteful um, in how we built and test our services. Um, so part of the pipeline is that we we become more focused on the resources that are needed at each stage in the deployment uh, pipeline. So if we only need a, a certain size of build environment or a certain size of test environment, then that's the size that we use. We don't just spin up a, a vanilla flavor in AWS and just hit it with builds and tests. We try to make it as lean as possible and try to reduce the amount of wastage. Uh, the entry level to deploying a service, uh, it was incredibly high, as I said earlier. You'd have to sit down with an ops folks, uh, somebody from ops, and go through the deployment and do a bit of debugging and stuff. We needed to reduce that down. Uh, lots of companies will say that they want developers to push production in the first day or first week of their employment. Um, we wanted to take a, a step further, um, as well as deploying a service. We wanted engineers to understand how the infrastructure was built and give them access to build that infrastructure themselves. Um, part of Skypilot was giving the developers the control to spin up these um, production-like clusters and um, Yep, I have a couple of quotes later on about how that worked out. Um, the iteration time, this was probably the most important part of the whole project. We needed to go from a yearly or monthly um, iteration cycle down to like uh, days or maybe perhaps even hours. Uh, once we're iterating really quickly, then it's much uh, quicker to catch issues. Uh, it's much cheaper. Uh, developers can catch problems themselves now. Um, in the past, we had run a new service for a pipeline, uh, be hitting all types of resources, you'd be running tests, you'd be uh, deploying to a certain environment and then it would explode. Um, because we have these shorter iteration times and we're giving developers control, they can catch those issues really early. A developer can just spin up a certain environment within 10 minutes, they can run their code in a distributed manner, they can run their tests and they catch the issues really quickly. Uh, so that helped us improve quality as well. And then the, the mandate was that we wanted to unlock engineering agility. Um, we wanted to just take away all the, all the nonsense that developers were putting up with. Um, they had to like, go back and forth to get access set up to different environments. They had to work with ops to get packages deployed. We just wanted to get rid of all that and give developers the control to deploy a full title themselves. Okay, 
So uh, I mentioned earlier that some of the processes that we had were, they're kind of, well, they're very reactive, they're chaotic, they weren't documented. Maybe one or two people in the entire company knew how it worked. Um, that's the initial state of the process, and we couldn't afford to let those types of processes into the continuous delivery pipeline. Um, it's just, it's far too risky. The only processes that we would allow into the continuous delivery pipeline, they had to be at least defined, managed, or in an optimized state. We needed complete traceability. We needed documentation. We needed proof of testing. Um, we basically couldn't allow any team to just drop a, a tool or a service into the pipeline. We just had to, to put our foot down and say, um, that's just, it just doesn't work in continuous delivery. In fact, it probably gets amplified because you're iterating so quickly. Whenever something does break, it breaks in quite a, a magnificent sort of fashion. So we tried to get every team up to the same point. We went in, we looked at teams that weren't as mature. We set up proper CI CD processes for them. And we helped them with documentation and we basically got them up to the point where they understood why they were doing this. It wasn't just a case of building a package and putting it into a a repo. They actually understood the full pipeline. They understood um, why the testing was happening in a particular order. They understood the full pipeline from start to finish. And I think that's really healthy. I think if your developers understand the entire pipeline, then they can kind of optimize their own tooling and their, their code to kind of fit into the continuous delivery sort of model. Um, I think that sort of visibility is really, it's, it's quite important for our engineers. Okay, so for a typical production title, um, right up until 2015, it would have taken probably between 20 and 30 engineers to get um, a title like Call of Duty rolled out. Um, that's a huge human cost. Um, it took weeks and months of planning, and whenever it did fail, it was very difficult to go in and, and fix it because you needed multiple people all in the same time zone working together to, to fix the problem. So we wanted to try and look at the continuous delivery process and see how many, how many steps we get down to, what's the smallest amount of steps, and could we actually have one developer deploy a production title on their own? Um, that's sort of the, the dream for Deanware. If we can have our engineers focusing on like adding value to the services, and deploying a production title is just as mundane as sending an email, then that's the direction we want to go. It shouldn't be this big sort of um, special event that happens every year, and there's lots of like fanfare. Uh, deploying Call of Duty should be as simple as an engineer sitting down, um, running a couple of scripts, following a pipeline, and then production title is set up. Uh, it shouldn't be as complicated as it was previously. Okay, so these are the principles of SkyPilot. Uh, the pipeline had to be incredibly re reliable. Um, our end user wasn't an ops person. It wasn't somebody who'd been in the company for 10 years. It could have been an intern who had been in Demonware for just a few days. Um, so the pipeline had to just work every time. We needed complete visibility in the pipeline. There couldn't be any black boxes. So as soon as the engineer um, creates a pull request, they can trace that all the way through to production. And we used a number of techniques to do this. Um, I mentioned later on that we, we used Jenkins purely for a, the sort of visibility that it gave us into the, the pipeline. Um, but we also did a few other cool things, like um, whenever we were passing a service image through the pipeline, um, we would update the, the metadata on the image. So whenever an image does get to production, we could trace it all the way back to source. And that would have links to test results, it would have links to the CD pipeline. It gave us complete um, uh, a, a way of just um, yeah, tracing the image all the way back to source. And that's really um, quite useful. Uh, we tried to make the, the pipeline as simple as possible. Um, the method we used for this was we put together a, an MVP and we got a bunch of managers to basically test it for us. Um, we figured like if a manager can do this, then it's, it's probably simple enough that an intern can do it. And it's, it worked out pretty well. Uh, and the managers highlighted a bunch of um, areas that we kind of took for granted as engineers. Um, yeah, so I'd recommend if you are working on a prototype or some sort of pilot project, if you get your managers to become testers, then that's a really uh, good method to take. We also needed the pipeline to be incredibly fast. Uh, I mentioned earlier that setting up a, a cluster manually and getting a service rolled out could take weeks. Um, we need our pipeline to run ideally in 15 minutes. And that includes like spinning up a, a new pod and deploying the services. Um, what it didn't include was the, the testing phase. And I'll come back to that later on. Testing is a real sort of uh, bottleneck at the moment. We can create these really fantastic 
um, continuous delivery pipelines, but the testing takes so long that uh, they, they kind of become useless. Uh, the pipeline might take 15 minutes to run, but the tests are taking like four hours. So that's a real sort of pain point, and I'll highlight later on uh, what we're doing to try and fix that. Okay, so we wanted to make this as easy as possible on the developers. So we stuck to a tool set that they understood. Um, Activision basically said to us, like, um, we want you to deliver um, SkyPilot on time. Whatever tools you decide is best to use, just use them. Um, so we had complete freedom, but we really wanted to um, just give developers something that they could use just straight off the bat. All the developers know Git, and they all know how to branch, create pull requests. It's really, um, it's just second nature to them. Um, over the past couple of years uh, leading up to SkyPilot, um, we'd done stuff like uh, we had Docker boot camps, um, we had like tutorials that we'd send around, we got our engineers involved in meetups, we had them giving talks at conferences, and um, we tried to encourage developers to become really um, quite capable in using Docker. And the majority of engineers at Demonware um, understand the API really well, and um, so we decided to stick with the, the Docker. Um, just to install from the, the general repo, and then we use some of the other tools, uh, like Compose, which the developers really liked. Um, the most common use case for a developer using Compose is that they would run it locally, spin up their test stack, run their tests, and then that file would get passed through into the, the build and test phases of the continuous delivery pipeline. Um, and developers seem to really like that. It just gives them that sort of cons consistency right from their local desktop into the CI CD pipeline. And then the Docker registry, um, we've had a Docker registry set up since probably late 2013. Um, yeah, everybody knows how to use it, it's really straightforward. So we wanted to keep it familiar and simple. So I just want to skip back a couple of slides. Uh, and that guy in the photograph, that's, um, he was my manager whenever I started using Docker and Demoware in 2013. And there's a lot of folks who were saying that Docker was Kool-Aid and kind of um, saying that it was too crazy. But like this guy, Damien Marshall, he was, um, he was very supportive. And um, probably if it wasn't for his sort of supportive firmness, we probably wouldn't have had Skypilot. I don't think we would have used containers. We'd st probably still be running bare metal. So I just wanted to call, call that out. OK, so we also had a chance to introduce some new tech. So we chose uh, Jenkins because we wanted to use pipelines as code. We wanted that traceability. Uh, we wanted the pipeline to be stored in Git. Um, there's lots of other nice things in Jenkins as well. Like we run our Jenkins inside containers, so it's completely portable. We run Jenkins in AWS and the DCs. It just moves wherever we need it. Um, developers can run their Jenkins locally, test their pipeline, and then push that into um, the production pipeline. So that's kind of nice as well. Uh, Mesos Marathon was chosen uh, primarily because of the sort of active community at the time. Uh, the evaluation was done back in 2016 at the beginning of the year, and at the time, Mrs. Marfin was that decided on being the most active project. It had the features we needed. Um, we did look at Kubernetes and Swarm. Um, at the time, both of those didn't really fulfill our needs, so we went with Mrs. Marfin. Uh, CoreOS was chosen by some of the ops folks because they wanted this lightweight OS that was easy for them to, to update, so that's why we went with uh, CoreOS. Um, databases was kind of pointed out at the very beginning of the project. This is going to be a real sort of pain point. We'd run our tests against MySQL containers, but we'd never run like multi-tenancy containers for MySQL. Um, so we really just kind of copped out and we just took the easy approach. And we basically stuck uh, single containers for MySQL onto single EC2 instances. Um, for a title like Skylanders, where the user base isn't massive, it, it worked out okay for us. Um, we just, we use a really simple topology. Uh, for likes of Call of Duty or a massive title, we wouldn't get away with that sort of um, that simplicity. We would need to look at running like multi-tenancy MySQL containers, and um, that's something that we're looking at at the moment. Okay, so I have some examples of workflows. Uh, the first one will look quite uh, familiar to a lot of developers in here, uh, building the service containers. So basically we have our developer will check out code, make their changes, test it locally, uh, create a pull request. Um, the pull request gets picked up by Jenkins. Um, we use Git hooks for this because we wanted to be able to report the status from Jenkins back into GitHub so that there's complete visibility, there's no gaps. As soon as you create the pull request, you get to see the status of your Jenkins job and you can click on the link and it takes you directly into the build. And that was really important. We couldn't have a pipeline that has like 
lots of gaps where you need specialist knowledge to figure out what's going on. It needs to be completely transparent for the developer. Um, so they would commit their changes, Jenkins would pick it up, would build a service container, would run tests against it. And at that point, uh, the test passed, it got pushed into a shared registry, and that's accessible by everybody in Daemonware. It's worth pointing out at this stage, there's nothing specific in this container to make it production-like. Okay, we left out the config to the next stage. So if a team was building a service and um, another team wanted to use it as part of system tests, they could just pull it from the shared registry and it would just work. Okay, it was created in like a default or a generic mode, so it had nothing specific and you could just um, pull it and just run it with a default config. And that was important. We didn't want teams to have to override like um, config and environment variables at, at runtime. We wanted it to be just, just work straight out of the box. So adding the configuration, um, this was one of the final um, like processes we did before pushing the container into production. So we had our config file, and that had the, the service configuration. It also had like the topology that would be used by Marfin, so it had that sort of metadata included. It was just a JSON file. And then we had a bunch of secrets inside of secrets JSON, and um, they basically got written on top of the service container. And once that was written in, we ran some quick um, sanity checks against it. And once that passed, then it went into a production registry. And once it's in the production registry, then it's a release candidate, so it can be rolled out at any time by anyone. Okay, so the part on the right-hand side of the screen is probably the most interesting. So once the secrets and config are baked into the image, um, it goes into this sort of restricted zone inside of AWS. I think we actually used the, the Amazon container registry for this. We could have run the, the, pri the open source Docker registry, but we decided to go with, I think, ACR at the time, or ECR. Um, yeah, so once the image is in there, it's a candidate, and we just made a call to Marathon, and that's how our deployments are done. So the developer can literally follow the, um, the service container from start all the way through in the Marathon, and then once they're happy that can be deployed, it's just one call, and then Marathon will handle the, the rollout of the service. Uh, so all this can be done through Jenkins. We just had a manual um, step at the end of the, the delivery pipeline, and just gives the option to roll out the service. Okay, so how did it work out? Uh, it worked out really well, actually. Um, a lot of people who doubted Docker and Daemonware um, actually admitted that it's probably one of the most boring launches we've ever had, and boring is really good when it comes to like launching games. Um, yeah, there's quite a lot of war stories. Um, maybe tell them later on after a few drinks. So yeah, the launch was really boring. Um, we had some extra capacity, not as much as we would normally add for a title, because we knew we could scale up quickly. So we had extra capacity at launch time, which was in October, and then we had extra capacity at Christmas, because there's always that double peak, and then it starts to tail off after Christmas. Uh, so the auto-scaling from um, Mrs. Marvin just worked. Yeah, we had no issues. I can't, I've got no, nothing exciting to say, it just worked. Um, this is important for another reason. Uh, typically at Christmas time, um, whenever a title is peaking for the second time, we'll have somebody who'll actually log in and keep an eye on things and add extra capacity. That, that's the way that used to be done um, in the past. Um, that's not how we're gonna do it in the future. Um, we're gonna use like auto-scaling as much as possible, and this was just a perfect example of uh, how we can just let the system handle itself. We can let it um, basically peak whenever it needs to and then um, drop down the resources as it's not required anymore. So I think that's nice from a developer's perspective. You're not really sitting on Christmas Day like having your, your dinner worried about how many users are online. You just, we knew it was working. Um, it was kind of battle tested for a number of months to make sure it would scale up and scale down and we didn't have any issues. So it was very boring. Okay, so the efficiencies. Uh, there's one that's not mentioned here. I'm just gonna cover it really quickly. Uh, we created this uh, VM called the Dev Environment, funnily enough. Um, and each developer used that to create their services as part of Skypilot. And we basically wanted to give developers like a single starting point that they could use. And the VM was just a CentOS VM that had Docker Compose, Docker, and it had the latest service images that would be used for testing. And each developer would pull this image uh, from a local mirror, and that would be their dev environment. So this would just the, the, the setup time massively. Uh, a developer could just come in day one uh, download the, the VM, and within a few minutes you have this full dev and test environment, and that meant that they could be committing code um, within minutes. Uh, I've seen developers in the past spend 
like maybe half a day or a day just trying to get the local environment set up and yeah we can't really afford those sorts of like um, we can't afford to be wasting time and some and that sort of like process okay so to build out a shared cluster it used to take days. It used to take an ops person, maybe somebody from dev. It used to take multiple meetings. There'd be a lot of hacking. We'd be using puppet rules. We'd be using um, some of our other internal tools. We'd be hacking config files. We'd be we'd basically poke it until it works. That's kind of the approach we took. Um, um, because of that, like every cluster was set up differently. Um, now, because we're using containers and we're using Mrs. Marvin to uh, schedule those containers, and we're using CloudFormation to spin up the the compute instances, um, that time was dropped down to about 20 minutes. And um, one person could spin up a, a shared cluster. Uh, deploying an actual title, again, uh, was reduced from hours down to minutes. And there's complete traceability as well. Um, if something was to break in the continuous delivery pipeline, it's really obvious where it's broken. Whereas in the past, you might uh, run a b bunch of puppet rules and a bunch of scripts that were written five years ago. And whenever it breaks, you're kind of just left uh, scratching your head, trying to figure out what had gone wrong. Um, with this, you had complete transparency. If a particular part of the pipeline broke, you got access to the log files, you got access to the system that it failed on, you're able to go in and poke around. Um, yep, recovery from outages. Uh, we used like auto remediation. So whenever there was a problem, Mrs. Marvin kind of was able to resolve it itself. It was able to tear down um, the containers and just replace them. And we had a couple of RCAs from that, but it's nothing really I can, can share, but maybe later on. Um, and then time to recover from a database failure as well. Um, this is something that used to send our ops and devs into a real sort of panic whenever a DB would fail. Um, everybody would be hustling to try and get it fixed. And it could take hours if you're lucky, or it could take days if you're unlucky. Um, yeah, we we're basically able to just kill the MySQL container, spin up a new one, and then sync it from master. So it took about a minute for this to happen. So what's next? Um, I mentioned earlier on about infrastructure as code. It's fantastic um, to a certain point, but once you have a large production cluster, you end up with thousands of lines of like YAML and JSON, and it becomes a bit unwieldy. Um, so we're planning to create a, a UI for our deployments. Uh, there's probably lots of um, third-party options out there, but we want to create something that's kind of specific to like our game services. So we're currently working on it at the moment. I mentioned the, the testing stage. Um, this is, at the moment, it's taken about four hours to run tests for like our most popular service, which is um, matchmaking. Uh, the plan is that we're going to use uh, Kubernetes or maybe Docker Swarm to create these test clusters that are shared across teams. And they, well, we basically want to like um, parallelize the test as much as possible, try and get the test time down to about five minutes. And um, that's what we're going to be working on this year. And then um, everything we learned in SkyPilot needs to be moved across to a larger title. So maybe Call of Duty or one of the big titles like Overwatch. Um, that's where we really prove that this is working. It worked really well for a smaller title. We need to make sure that's going to scale up further. And then education. Um, I think it's really important for developers to understand the full process from start to finish, understand how the pipeline works, which environments um, are being used, how the environments are being built. So we're going to go out into the different teams and we're going to provide Jenkins training. We're going to give them some basic training like Ansible that we use for building our environments. Uh, we're going to basically give them access to all the tools and all the knowledge that the build engineering team have. And just kind of show them like this is the full process. You may never have to go into this environment, but at least you have access to the tools and you have like traceability. You can see where these environments came from. So I think it's very important for us to, to educate our developers. Okay, I just have two quotes left and then I'm done. Um, Lisa is one of the project managers that worked on Skypilot. And um, she didn't really have any sort of like dev experience at all. She'd never used Git before. So she's the perfect candidate to um, test out the, the pipeline against. So we basically just gave Lisa a fresh system that had Git installed and we just watched her for an hour to see how she would handle it. And um, yeah, she did okay. It took her about 45 minutes to roll out a, a config change which is pretty good considering she had no technical knowledge. And um, at the end, she said um, she was quite impressed at the fact that whenever she committed her change, she could see the change going all the way through the pipeline into production. She didn't feel at any point that she was kind of left hanging and she didn't know what was going on. So that visibility was really important. And then Anar was one of our uh, main customers for Skypilot. And a couple of weeks after we launched Skylanders, 
an hour came over to my desk, and you could just see the joy in his face. Um, an hour's been deploying titles for about four years at Demonware, and he's always worked with ops folks, and it's taken days and weeks to set up clusters. And he came over and he said, um, just before SkyPilot was launched, I was able to roll out five production clusters in 20 minutes on my own. I used to see he was so happy about this. He didn't have any reliance on another team. He had complete control. He had visibility into what was being um, put into the cluster. And he was able to like, run his own tests inside there without having to go to different teams and ask for permissions and ask for help. So I think that's probably the most um, powerful message from SkyPilot is just we really empowered the developer to not only deploy their services, but actually deploy the, the entire infrastructure required for a title. And that's what SkyPilot was all about. So that's it. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to jump up to the mic, I'll try and answer them for you. It's a two-part. Um, were you guys affected by the outage, the storage outage in AWS back on February 28th? And if so, what are you guys doing? Or if not, what are you guys planning to do or do to protect yourselves from a cloud outage of that nature? Yeah, as far as I know, we weren't affected. Um, we do put backups in S3, but we don't uh, host any live systems. Um, we have our own DCs with um, storage that we use for like live systems. Um, but yeah, we're kind of looking at a, a hybrid model, so we don't know. Maybe in future, we, if we do like peak to the cloud, which is quite a common sort of um, technique, where like you you basically host the base of your service uh, internally in your DC, and then you you scale out to AWS, then we potentially might be impacted by S3. But um, as far as I know, we weren't on February 28th. All right, question over here. Hello. Hi. Hey. Uh, you mentioned you use uh, a containerized Jenkins. Yeah. Uh, did you have any problems building Docker containers within the Dockerized Jenkins? Um, good question. So do you mean Docker and Docker, like yeah. using the Jenkins master to build the images? Yeah. yeah, we kind of um, we did play with that a bit, but I think as soon as you run Docker and Docker, then you kind of break portability. At least that used to be the case, where like the client and server APIs, if they were mismatched in any way, it would break. Um, so we actually just we containerized the Jenkins, and then we just like ran our agents on bare metal or on VMs. Um, we used like the Swarm plugin, which is really cool, um, just for connecting the agents up. But we didn't actually build Docker images from the from the container. Thanks. Hello, uh, still on Jenkins. Do, do you use um, the pipeline plugins with Jenkins files to uh, to go to get the slaves directly in container uh, with Docker nodes, or it's something you you forget about? Um, yeah, so we use the well, at the time we use the pipeline as code. Um, I think CloudBees have rebranded it since as maybe pipelines. Um, but yeah, we're kind of changing that again. Um, we had a lot of groovy code for the pipeline, but we're moving to the cloud of pipelines now, which is kind of a, the next sort of evolution. Um, so we will be using like the, the built-in Docker plugins inside the pipelines, and we're also creating our own global libraries that teams can use. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> kind of. You can grab me later on if we have a chat. Hi, what did you use for uh, monitoring, and specifically, do you use monitoring in your CI CD pipeline? Um, monitoring is kind of our weak spot, unfortunately. Um, in our CI CD pipeline, no, um, is the short answer. Yeah, I don't really have much visibility into the monitoring, to be honest. We can kind of have a chat later on. I know that we were using Datadog for like pumping logs into, and um, yeah, we had like we had the pipeline hooked up to like Victor Ops and stuff, so we were kind of alerted whenever stuff was breaking. But um, I can't, I don't really have much more detail than that, unfortunately. But we can chat later on. That's okay. Oh, hello. Um, I have a question. How do you deal with the explosion of Jenkins jobs for every team that every Jenkins job multiply times a number of environment times a number of teams? How, how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, initially, we tried to run everything on the one master, and it kind of it just didn't scale well. Uh, we wanted to stick with the open source Jenkins, and we kind of hit a limit, about 120 um, slaves. So we actually, well, we created like a Jenkins farm that had multiple masters and multiple slaves, and they were all using like the Elastic uh, plugin. 
So every master could spin up their, their instance or their slaves in AWS. So that's basically how we scaled. Uh, if we didn't have any bills, then we had no agents. If we needed a dozen branches built, then we just scaled up the, the um, slaves across like AC, uh, AWS EC2 instances. So what was uh, maybe one of your biggest problems with corporate culture or processes and introducing this new technology and how did you overcome that? Okay, good question as well. Um, so back in 2015, I gave a talk about um, cultural change using Docker. And the way we introduced Docker was we just did it gradually over time. We basically followed like the eight steps of, um, of change. Um, there was a lot of pushback initially, so we did stuff like we introduced it into a couple of small functions, like we used Docker for building artifacts, we used it for running a few unit tests, and we just gradually introduced it into um, people's sort of um, mindset. But it, it took literally two and a half years to get everybody on board. It's quite a slow process. Um, but it's more change of mindset, like introducing the tech, we pretty much did that overnight. We switched all our, our artifact builds from like VMs to containers in one day. But trying to convince ops and devs that Docker was the right path took, took us years. Um, there's a link to, well, I can send a link to that presentation. There might be something interesting in there. Hi, also one question. Uh, how did you deal with the difference in like, development speed between your services and the game client if you had to test them in conjunction? Because normally game clients have way longer development cycles for features? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess we tried to build a process so it was like as lean and as iterable as possible so it can be applied to like any type of code, like the client code or the backend services. Um, but I think that's one area we, we kind of need to focus on is the client code um, this year. Um, we kind of, well, we kind of ignored it for Skypilots and kind of focused more on the backend services. But we learned so much from Skypilot that we can definitely apply like some of those practices into the client code and try to make that experience more enjoyable for our developers. Because like you should say, it's a different sort of life cycle and it takes much longer to get client code uh, changes rolled out. Okay. okay. All right, great, thanks a lot. Um, okay, everyone. Um,